Psalm 109, verses 9 through 10, continues the prayer for the condemnation against unjust authorities and those who would act against the living word of God. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg, and let them seek their bread also from their desolate place. You cannot find anything more alarming than this imprecatory prayer. Those that invoke judgment, calamity, or curses upon one's enemies, or those perceived as the enemies of God, especially if this were to be prophetically applied to Judas Iscariot and others who would betray God's trust. Verse 7 of this psalm records these faithful words of judgment. When he is judged, and as it applies to Judas Iscariot, the word of God is very clear on the subject. Judas was a guilty man. In fact, the Lord Jesus said as much in Matthew 26, 23-24. The one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Many teach that the passage in this psalm is prophetically applicable to Judas Iscariot. If that's true, then it would indicate that Judas was married and had children, although the New Testament makes no such statement. In any case, point taken, there is nothing in the word that is more dreadful than what we read in this imprecatory prayer. In John 3.36, Jesus gives a wonderful imitation. He also gives the contrary side of it as if, as if he was contrasting both light and darkness. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. This psalm makes the condition for a betrayal of the trust of God that, that God has placed in those with authority as frightening. The betrayer's demise leaves a widow and a fatherless child who will suffer on the account of the father's unrighteous actions as the role model. The children of this forsaken union will usually continue to suffer as if they were vagabonds and will be forced to beg for morsels of truth because of the immoral childhood training enacted upon them by the depraved parent. This remains true in our day as well. The window of a person's integrating the gospel narrative on the virtue uh, on virtue narrows as the child matures. Some teach that there are many ways to salvation, but that is completely foreign to the Word of God. As we have just read in John 3.36, unless a person accepts the propitiation of Jesus through repentance and acceptance, the wrath of God remains on them. Jesus said in John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The Spirit writes through Jude in verses 11 and 12, paraphrased, Woe to them, for they have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Jesus Christ endured God's wrath for us on our behalf so that we could receive his imputed righteousness. On this side of grace, we should be praying for the restitution of the wicked and not their condemnation. Christ died for all who will repent and receive his reconciliation to the Father. He, his is the only way of salvation. We must trust in his propitiation. If we do not, God's wrath will remain upon all who do not receive him. This is the great exchange. God reconciled sinful man to himself by making his sinless son the sin bearer and dying in our stead. For all have sinned. Jesus paid the death penalty for the sinner so that God could set the sinner free and declare him righteous in his holy presence. Moreover, he did more than just forgive us our sins. He imputed the righteousness of his son to us. A great exchange took place on the cross. Christ took upon himself all of our sin and guilt and suffered God's wrath. We, in turn, received his right standing before the Father. His righteousness was swapped for our sin. This is confirmed in 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Father made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him.